know what? You just want to get more information on the church. Plan on attending those classes, and that will begin October 2nd. There'll be more information to come. And then uh, Sound Booth Ministry, you'll see on the tear-off tab that if you would be interested in helping the guys in the booth run the soundboard, run the media shout or vmix for the recording, um, they would love to have you participate. So if you have an interest, you can, I'm trying to think who it says here, um, touch base with Pastor Doug so that we can get you the necessary training. Uh, we have a number of younger kids and teens doing it. They're doing a great job, but they could use the help. And so if you'd be interested, uh, please sign up on the tariff tab and you can put that in the offering box, which on Sunday evenings will be in the back of the room. Those are all the announcements that I want to draw your attention to. So at this time, if we could bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, together this evening. And as we just heard in the, the prelude, the last song, near to the heart of God. Lord, that is our desire to be drawn closer and closer to you. Uh, Lord, to grow in our fellowship with you, uh, to grow in our intimacy with you. Lord, to yield more and more to you and to see your word planted deep in our hearts. And, and Lord, we, we don't just want a head knowledge. We, we want it planted in our hearts that we could live from that truth, respond to that truth. Uh, Lord, to not only enjoy our fellowship with you, but Lord, in living like you to make you known to this world around us. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for times like this evening where we can gather together as, as believers, in like faith, believers of like faith and, and to sing songs of praise to your name, to hear the word of God and, and to have preaching from the word of God. And so, Lord, we ask tonight that you would speak to us from your word, uh, that you would help our hearts to be challenged and rejoice at the same time. And, and, and Lord, again, if there be anything in our lives that's not in line with your word, that even through the topic at hand tonight, that you would help us to, to rectify that and to submit and surrender that to your will. Um, Lord, we, we pray for our young people. Uh, Lord, we're excited tonight's the first night of Pioneer Club, and we're so thankful for the, the enthusiasm of those children as they head down that hallway to that classroom. And Lord, what a wonderful opportunity that we have to begin laying a biblical foundation in their hearts and lives. Um, Lord, Sunday nights, it's not just something to do or to fill a schedule. It is a deliberate, um, a deliberate um, program put in place so these children can come to know you and, and learn to serve you and to love you. And so, Lord, we lift them before you and pray that you would open the, the understanding of the hearts of these children that, Lord, sooner than later, they would profess Jesus Christ as Lord. We also pray for our teenagers, Lord, and, and youth group. And we thank you for our leaders who have studied this week and for Pastor Doug who studied this week uh, to prepare messages for them to hear your truth. And, and Lord, our, our desire is to see them no longer hang off the coattails spiritually of their parents, but Lord, that they would, they would respond out of a genuine relationship with you, out of love for you. And, and Lord, we ask that you would just continue to draw the hearts of our teens to yourself. And uh, Lord, that you would guard them, uh, guide them, protect their hearts and their minds from the ways of this world and from the enemy. And, and Lord, even from their own sinful, uh, sinful desires from within. And uh, Lord, again, that these, these teens would be a bright light for you. And Lord, for our hearts tonight, give us ears to hear. Uh, Lord, give us hearts that are soft, ready to receive the truth of your word. And Lord, we'd ask that you be glorified through our time together. We love you. We, we praise you and we thank you in the precious name of your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, our scripture reading for this evening is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 14, the apostle Paul, as he winds down this letter to the church in Thessalonica, says this, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself 
sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. You know, as you read there in, or you listened there, maybe read along in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we have been called to a number of things as believers. Our lives, as we shared this morning, should look nothing like this world around us, but we can be encouraged that everything that God calls us to, we have the promise from his word that as we look to him, as we yield to him, as this word is planted into our hearts, it says, faithful is he who will, in the King James it says, who will do it. And so let us lift our voices in song together as we praise his great faithfulness, singing, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And everyone said, amen. We can be grateful for the, the grace and the faithfulness that God has shown us through his son, Jesus Christ, who through his own work on the cross has delivered us from the bondage of sin. And as great as our sin is, thank God that his grace is so much greater. Let's sing together grace that's greater than our sin as we recognize what God has done for us.
Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin marvelous infinite matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And everyone said, amen. Verse three was so good, we jumped right back into that. Do you notice that? In Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 through 21, as we consider how good God has been to us and, and what he has done on our behalf, Paul told the Ephesians, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul tells the Ephesians as he challenges them, he's getting ready to challenge them to walk together in unity. He's getting ready to challenge them to grow in their knowledge and understanding of the word. He's, he's getting ready to challenge them to no longer walk according to the course and the pattern of this world, but to live by the word that's been entrusted to them. And he calls their attention as he's getting ready to do that to the one who can do far more than you can ever ask or think. There's nothing that you could ask of God in accordance to his will that he can't do abundantly that much more. He is more than able to meet whatever the need is that, that comes, uh, comes around. And you and I can trust that because, friends, he's already met your greatest need if you're in Christ today. And so you can trust him, whatever the struggle, whatever the trial, and with the challenge that you're going to hear again tonight, a piggyback from this morning, um, specifically in our relationships with our spouses and really with each other. And as we sing our next song, it's one the choir sang um, 
I can't remember his last season. It might have been last season. It could have been the last two or three in a row. It's one of our favorites. But this is a new song. And I want to encourage you as, as you catch the tune, sing along. But as you, you sing, my heart is filled with thankfulness to him in verse one who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart. You know what we deserve? The absolute opposite of what Christ has done. And so let your heart and mind be filled with thankfulness and gratitude for what God has done. And let that be the impetus for the change he aspires to make in our lives. Let's sing together. My heart is filled with thankfulness. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and robed his law of righteousness with power upon my heart. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fear to fly. Whose every promise is enough for every step I take, sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with grace. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above, whose wisdom is my perfect peace, whose every thought is love. For every day I have on earth is given by the King. So I will give my life, my all, to love and follow Him. How many would say that's the first time you sang that? Yeah, it won't be the last, I promise. But if you were in choir, I don't know if you found that it's hard to not sing it the way we learned it as I did. But um, speaking of choir, next Sunday after church, immediately following the service, you get the first announcement on this. If you um, have sang in the choir in the past or you would aspire to have a good time and we have a good time praising the Lord together, I want to encourage you after the service to meet in the choir room next Sunday morning as we look to get that ministry rolling for the fall season. And so, Dr. Jim, that's my plug for the choir for this evening. And those, these are the kinds of songs we'll be singing. We'd love to have you join your voices with us. Um, we're going to sing one more before we go to the Word this evening. And, um, you know, what we can have hearts filled with thankfulness that we are not, we don't have to live lives that are built on shifting sand. Uh, we don't have to wonder... Uh, where the bedrock of life is, um, like much of the world around us, we have lives as Christians that are built on the solid rock. And so let's rejoice in that together as we sing the solid rock. Words are on the screen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, 
All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered in His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When He shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in Him be found, Dressed in His righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground is sinking sand, All other ground is sinking sand. And everyone said, Amen, indeed. As we turn to the Word of God tonight, as we get ready to do that, you'll notice that the scriptures um, and the songs, every one of them very deliberately spoke in reference to the faithfulness of God in our lives. Um, specifically, the faithfulness he's demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ, in redeeming us as lost, fallen men and women to himself by him and his work alone. God has been faithful, will always be faithful. And the name of the, the message you can see on the screen is that, you know, as faithful as he's been, his life in us, may we be found faithful. And so find us faithful. And as we continue, again, this is a, a kickoff from this morning's uh, message. Definitely will not, be, will not be as long, maybe not even as deep, but just, a, just an encouragement from what we heard this morning. And as we get started, a little uh, silly illustration. A little girl had just heard the story Snow White for the first time. And the little girl was so full of enthusiasm that she could hardly contain herself as she told the, the fairy tale verbatim back to her mother. And after telling about how Prince Charming had arrived on this beautiful white horse and kissed Snow White back to life, she asked her mother, and do you know what happened next? Yes, said her mom, and they lived happily ever after. No, responded Susie with a frown. They got married. <laughs> you can laugh, it's funny. With childlike innocence, the little girl had spoken a partial truth without realizing it. As this commentator said, for you see, getting married and living happily ever after are not necessarily synonymous with each other. Additionally, a, a cynic once, once observed, all marriages are happy. It's the living together afterward that causes all the trouble. You know, as, as you hear those, and I know that even that second one, um, you know, we talked about that this morning, but you're the day of the service. It's beautiful, usually lighthearted, jovial. You got the music playing, cakes getting smashed in people's faces unless your wife physically threatens you because that dress is expensive and if icing touches that, your life is in jeopardy on day one of your marriage. That may or may not be true. And so it was true actually. And so, you know, the day of can be absolutely lighthearted, jovial. But you know what? As days go by and weeks and months and years, especially if that marriage isn't grounded on the truth of God's word, you will find that to be true. While the marriage event was jovial and happy and even you could say rewarding and fulfilling, the days living together, maybe not so much. And so, again, that, that little girl's um, innocent take on that, and the cynic as well, um, way too often there's truth in what both of them have said. And so, two questions here as we get into three brief points this evening. How can we be sure to turn the tides in our own lives? How can we make sure that that's not the story of us? 
Um, and, and I would just say this. You might be sitting there saying, you know what? I'm not married and I don't plan to get married. You could say that um, you know, whatever the case would be. That's true. Maybe you're married. Maybe you're not married. You're never going to get married. But here's the truth. As a Christian, we will have the opportunity to come alongside of people. Amen. That's our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside of one another. You may have opportunities to give counsel. And we want to make sure that the counsel that we give is biblical, it's godly, and it's right. And so we can be sure to not only turn the tides in our own lives, but as you have opportunities to speak to people, you can make sure you're sharing the truth as you stand on the solid rock that they might too. And then secondly, how can we have a better attitude not only in marriage, but in all that God has called us to do as his people? How can we walk into the life that God has called us to? I mean, you heard in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you know, that we are to be rejoicing always, to give thanks, to rejoice evermore, uh, to, to, to not be, let me, let me just go back and actually look at it. And there's some good meat inside that, that passage. And, and this is what you and I have been called to. So how do we do this? You, to admonish the unruly. How many of us like to come alongside of people who don't want to be come alongside of? And Paul tells the Thessalonians to, to come alongside of them. We, we like this a little better. Encourage the faint-hearted, those who are struggling. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Well, that's what we're called to. See that no one, and that means none of us, repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek after. So it's not even enough to not do wrong things. To seek after is an ongoing action verb where you and I are to constantly be seeking to do the right and good things. So it's not just the absence of wrong. As Christians, we are to be seeking to do good. And it says, for all people, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then he says, do not quench the Spirit. So we need to be responsive to what God wants to do in our lives. How can we be better prepared to do that? Point number one is this. Remember the overall purpose of your life. This seems so easy, doesn't it? But when I tend to forget that the overall purpose of my life isn't me, I find myself, when I, when I forget, and all of a sudden I put me as the purpose, I put my wants, I put my desires, I put my pleasures, I put my joys, I start to get things out of whack. And that's not just in reference to marriage, but I will say that my greatest struggle in marriage most of the time almost all the times I share with the marriage class this morning is not typically Melissa. It's, it's Pastor Scott. It's Pastor Scott. Not, it's not even just what I should be doing for her. It's when I don't respond in obedience to what God is doing and wants to do in my life. I need to remember the overall purpose of my life first. And I gave them a half sheet. We have 14 lessons that I have. It's going to be a mini miracle if I get done in two, in two quarters. I have 28 you could be praying 26, actually, not 28, 13 and 13 is 26. I only have 26. That means I only have 24 left to get through that entire book. You can be in prayer for my class and for this teacher. But we're going to go through 14 heavy hitting areas. We will be talking about communication. We're going to be talking about in-law relationships. We're going to be talking about sex and intimacy in marriage, and it's very in-depth. We're going to be talking about um, conflict and conflict resolution. We're going to be talking about expectations in marriage. We're going to do an assessment of where we thought things would be when we got married to where they really are now and how we adjust to all those things. And you know what? As we go through that course, I want them to follow this little framework that we gave them. Because if I can begin to look at everything within marriage and everything within my life, under this, and I mean, this isn't my words. This really is just God's word. Number one is what is the ultimate purpose of our marriage? And every premarital session starts with this. And the very first session starts with this. And every marital session starts with this. And the answer is the honor and glory of God. The purpose of everything that we do in this life as believers is for the honor and glory of God. Just let God's word speak to us on that. Colossians 3, 23 to 24, whatever you do, do your work heartily. You give it everything you've got. Again, this is like a broken record, but I can't tell you how many people, and even in the past week, are lamenting that there aren't people willing to step up and just do their job. This is a moment, and I said this this morning in reference to marriage, but it's in reference to everything that we do as believers. This is an opportunity, one of those shining moments where we can make Christ known. And Paul told the, the, the Colossian believers, Whatever you do, that means everything. Do your work heartily as for the Lord. 
And so when I wake up in the morning and I want to say something I shouldn't be, especially to Melissa or the kids, the first thing that should come to mind is that I'm not just doing this for them. I'm doing this for Christ. When it comes to dealing with the difficult people in our lives, we'll face that throughout a day. Remember, you're not doing that for them. You're doing this for Christ first. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Ask for the Lord rather than for men. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. And that's not just the, the blessing of his provision now, but an eternal reward waiting us in glory. And then Paul says, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And I wanna serve him well because 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says this, or do you not know that your body, and listen, I say that, or do you not know, is it possible that there were those in Corinth that did not know that now born again, blood bought believers in Jesus Christ, that their lives were no longer theirs. That construct can be used two different ways. One way is like, didn't you know that? The other is like, are you kidding me? You didn't know that? And the truth is if you and I are in Christ today, we recognize what God has done, don't we? You know that you were a wretched depraved sinner and so was I and so am I. And we know what God has done through Jesus Christ, his son to redeem us back unto himself, right? And so we recognize that lives that were stuck in the pit of sin in, and, and bound for death, hell, and the grave had been ransomed. They've been resurrected, so to speak, as Christ was raised from the dead. We've been raised from spiritual death to life. And guess what? We now have a new master, and it's not you or me. It's Jesus Christ, the one who's redeemed us. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple, the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And, and maybe you're in here today, and you're wrestling with this, but you're like, you know what? No, maybe I didn't know my life is not my own. But by the authority of the word of God, I can tell you if you're in Christ, your life now belongs fully to him. And Paul tells these Corinthians who were struggling mightily with their commitment to Christ and each other, for you have been bought with a price. And chapel, you know what that price is, don't you? Let me ask you, do you? Sometimes the word of God can be so simplistic that we just bounce right past what we say and what we read. We have been bought with a price, something we could never pay. When, when we think about, and we're actually, I'm gonna get ahead of myself, I don't wanna do that. You've been bought with a price, therefore, not Pastor Scott's word, these are God's word, may it be true for each of us. Glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body means with my hands, with my feet, with this tongue that articulates words that can bring life and encouragement, but just as quickly can bring discouragement and death. With this mind that thinks everything this body is capable of is to be glorifying God. And that leads right into what we talked about this morning in reference to, to marriage. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, what will that look like to do everything you do heartily as for the Lord? What will it look like for us in the parameters of marriage? Or if you have the chance to come alongside of someone looking for counsel, what will it look like to do that as unto the Lord for the glory of God with these lives that are his? Verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. And I love these next four words. And so does my wife, as to the Lord. Ladies, the job that you have been called to is, is going to be difficult. From the very beginning in, in the book of Genesis, after the sin in the garden, you remember what God says to Adam and Eve, is that, that, that your, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. God had put a hierarchy in the home and the man was to be, and you're going to see this, the loving, patient, protective, secure leader over that home. Spiritually speaking, he's to lead you, to guide you, and to point you to Christ, to cherish you, to nurture you. But what God tells Adam and Eve is that while he's to have that place, your desire will be for that position. And so, and I love what it says here, because sometimes I'm not going to do my job well. And sometimes there are seasons, maybe I'm not even doing my job at all in that moment. And it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to 
the Lord. As you think of the marital context, and, and this is what I'll share with the couples that sit before me. Number one, in premarital counseling. And number two, when the wheels seem like they're falling off. And, and we feel like packing it up and giving in. I try to remind them, remember, everything you do is, is unto the Lord. And wives, especially when it comes to yielding to your husbands, it says, as to the Lord. You're looking straight past the deficiencies, the insufficiency of your husband, and even the bonehead mistakes that we make at times. And you're staring straight on, full on at Jesus Christ, the, the object of your faith, the redeemer of your life, the head of us as the church and as believers. We're looking straight to him as the source and as the reason for our obedience. And verse 23 goes on to say, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Gentlemen, your job is going to be very much difficult because what you get called to do is exactly what Christ did for the church. And one thing I will say, as I share with these couples, our jobs is to make the other person's job easier. Husbands, you are not called to tell your wives in some caveman mentality, you submit to me. That's not our job. That's the job description God has given Christian wives. In the same token, ladies, you are not called to tell your husbands to love you as Christ loved the church. No, that's a job description God has already given us. Our job is to make it easier for each to, to do this. So husbands, if we want our wives to reverence us and to fall in line under our leadership, godly leadership, then it is imperative that we adhere to the job description God has graciously given us. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church." because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband." As you listen to what God has called us to, specifically remembering the purpose of your life and in, in this context of this morning, our marriages, one pastor said this in light of the commitment we just read about. He stated it this, and I, and I quote, with the rising divorce rate and the trend toward total truthfulness these days, it is almost as though the marriage vows are being changed from till death do us part to till something better comes along do us part. What we are called to do in marriage in our own strength is impossible. When I tell you that as your pastor, I will fight as hard as anyone else to see every marriage in this church remain intact, I mean that with everything I have. And when I, when I said this morning that I believe our marriage is one of the greatest platforms that we can show the world around us who Christ is, I mean that. You might think that your marriage is just about you, but every facet of your marriage, the way I speak to my wife, the, the way I handle my wife, the way I care for my wife, the way that I nourish my wife, the way that I make my wife feel secure, the way I respond to her when she's off, the way she responds to me when Pastor Scott is off. You know what? It's not just what's going on in our home that matters to us. Us, this entire world around us is watching the interactions that are taking place in your home and mine. And one of the things that I've learned through, through counseling, and I've learned to say this, and I've said this a lot, you know what, the marriage that you aspire to have is a whole lot closer than you think it is. It's as close to your heart and your eyes being fixed on Jesus Christ. The counseling curriculum I use, actually, I take that back, Weekend to Remember. Bob was his first name. I'd love to give Bob credit for giving this illustration. But each couple that I do premarital counseling with, I give them each a quarter when we get to the specific point. And, and here's what happens. When, when, when wives aren't submitting to their husbands as to the Lord, 
and husbands aren't loving their wives as Christ loved the church, it tends to be because I'm not fixed on Christ. You know, I want, I want to say that our role in marriage is never contingent on what the other person does. That's how the world works. Husbands, you love your wives no matter if supper's burnt, no matter if your laundry's not, not done, the laundry's not folded, the laundry's not put away. There's 17 inches of dirt and filth, which that's horrible. It should never be on the floor. And by the way, you may be helping do that job too. That's not just her job. It depends on the situation. But your love for her is not contingent upon her reverence for you. Contrary, on the same side, ladies, your reverence to your husbands is not based on their love for you, but rather God's love for you. And what God is doing in you, you're doing that for him. But see what happens when we get our eyes out of focus and we're not fixed on Christ, we start looking and fixating on the faults of each other. And it's not long until this line of thinking that you just heard, till death do us part becomes till something better comes along. And if I take this quarter and it's a poor illustration today but if I close my one eye and I hold this quarter up, I can literally position this, that this quarter, it's what, about an inch? Can block out the entire sun. I close one eye, I bring it back, I can block out the entire sun that lights, illuminates the, the, our, entire, uh, our entire solar system and, and brings warmth and light to this, this earth. I can block it out by focusing on one little thing. And what Bob and his wife said is that when you and I fixate on the 1% or 2% of what our spouses do that drive us nuts, we miss the 98% of what brought us joy and drew us together in the first place. What we focus on matters immensely. And so number one, we have to remember the overall purpose of our lives and our marriages. And it's the glory of God through the life of Christ in us. Secondly, and again, this, we talked about this this morning, but remember God's will in regards to your marital lives. In Matthew chapter 19, verses one through nine, we read these words and we kind of glean that from Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 23 as well. But in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse one, it says, when Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan and large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of, the, of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality and marries another, commits adultery. When you, when you consider what the will of God is, for your life. You know, and, and I know it, it, can, it can be difficult. It can be messy. I had several people ask me after the service, well, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? And, and what I said, God's word is very crystal clear. It really is crystal clear on the, the matter of divorce and remarriage. And someone said, but what about this? What about this? There is a reason that as a church, our, our main focus, especially individually, but also corporately together should be the holiness of God, holiness re realized in our lives, growing in the knowledge of God. It is not enough just to show up at church on Sunday morning. It's not enough just to hear what Pastor Scott says once or twice a week. We must be grounded in this word. And listen, the generation coming up, when I say that we've not done a very good job of showing them what commitment to the word of God looks like, I'm not kidding. I mean that. When there is, an, and this is not to cast shade, my wife said, but what about the people who have already been through indiscretions currently? You know what? You stand faithfully on the word of God and you love your spouse, wives, you reverence your husbands. Husbands, you, you love your wives as Christ loved the church and you redeem whatever that brokenness was that led to your marriage in the first place. That's what we do. But we have a generation rising up, listen, that doesn't recognize or realize what the word of God says on the topic of marriage. 
We're worried, and I get it, we should be worried about budgets, and we should be worried about this and that or the other and all these balloons. But listen, when we lose our grounding in the Word of God, especially in the area of marriage and families, do you know as, the, as, as goes the families, as goes the home, goes the church and the nation with it? Do you believe that? I've heard that since I was a kid in government class. But when it comes to marriage, church, we have an obligation to tell the children around us, the teenagers around us, that there is a way. And guess whose way it is? It's God's way. Because it doesn't matter what the world is around us. One day they won't stand before a human judge. One day they will give an account for the way they've handled this word. But guess what? So will we. And Jesus is clear, crystal clear in reference to what our marriages should look like. And while I'm sorry that culture around us has changed its mind repeatedly as to what God should say is okay, I wanna encourage you to remember that God has not changed his mind. God has not changed his word. He's given us his word to follow. He's given us his will in this word. And in reference to our marriages, we, we have it right here. We really do. I've been asked this question repeatedly. So Pastor Scott, you mean to tell me, despite all that's gone on, and frankly, can I say that within the church, we don't even always get to the point where couples are willing to take biblical counsel. That breaks my heart. So many times we get, beat, we get to the point where families have broken and we've never had a chance to even apply the truth of God's word. And I am a fighter for that. And I want you to know if you're struggling, don't think you're struggling alone. There is a body of believers here and a pastor. And, and whether you're here or you're watching online, it doesn't matter. We want to take you through the word of God and see what God would have for your marriage, the blessing he has for your marriage. But the, you mean to say that after all this time, after all these things, after all that's been said, all all that's been done, you say there's still hope for this marriage. And my word is one word, yep. Why? Because it's the will of God for your life. And there's something that I know from God's word that we can hope in today. Because everything that we need to accomplish the will of God, he's given and he will provide regardless of what area it is in your life, but especially your marriages in mine. In Matthew chapter six, starting in verse nine, it's the passage we refer to as the Lord's prayer. Really, it's a pattern of prayer. Hear the word, and, and, I, and I know that I'm a little passionate. And I know I'm a little tired. I'm getting a little more fired up and emotional than I thought I would tonight. But my heart is breaking not only for this nation, but for our church body as well. When I tell you that I know what it feels like to grow up in a home with brokenness, insecurity, not able to trust anything or anyone, always waiting for the wheels to fall off, I say that because I really do know what that feels like. And I know that there's not a child that should feel that. And I know what it sounds like when there's a parent crying their eyes out because they want to hold things together, but the other one won't have it. I understand, I really do. And in some ways I've walked where some of us have walked or where some may end up walking and my heart goes out. But this much I know to be true. It didn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And there is hope for us today. And that which God has called us to, I promise you, he will give you everything you need to turn the ship around when necessary. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As Jesus starts out, he's like, I want your eyes fixed on the one who's holy, righteous, and just. And listen, if you're a Christian in this house today, you now know what Jesus did on your behalf because of the holiness of God. You know the new life that you have, the Holy Spirit in your heart that's been given because of what Christ did through his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension back 
back to the right hand of the Father. He says, hallowed be thy name. And when you recognize who God is, all that he's done, what that means to you and I as believers, the next part of this prayer will come naturally through the spirit of God in us. Thy kingdom come. We want the kingdom of God realized and established in our hearts on this earth. And we want it right now because we know it's the very best thing for us. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. His will, because he's our sovereign, he's our master. His ways are perfect, righteous, and just, and good. Knowing who he is, he says, we pray that way. And then he says this in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. In your prayer, you have just poured out who God is to you, who he is to this world, who he is to this marriage that we're in if we're, if we're in, in, in a married relationship. We recognize that of all things we long for, we want the kingdom of God and we want it now realized in our hearts, but ultimately physically right here on this earth. And we want his will to be accomplished in and through our lives because as 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 say, we recognize he bought them, they're his. And when we pray for that daily bread, we're praying that he would give us the daily sustenance to see that accomplished through these lives that he's given. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In your life, Christian first, you seek Christ first. You seek the kingdom of God. You seek his righteousness and you long to see it realized in and through your heart and life. And here's what I know. If a husband and a wife, both in Christ, are seeking God and his righteousness, longing to see that realized as imperfect as they may be, they're in a marriage that will be built to stand the test of time. Well, let me ask us this question because I know we can say it with our mouths, but when I look around and see what we're doing, I don't know that we really believe this to be true. The question I wrote in my minute, or, you know, my minutes, we're not in a trustees meeting, that I wrote in my notes. It's been a long weekend. <laughs> Do I really believe that the one who raised his son from the dead and back to resurrection life can deal with the brokenness in my life, can put back together the pieces to meet the areas that are lacking. And definitely in reference to marriage or any relationship, bring the healing that's needed to take them from struggling to thriving. Because if we believe that the same God that rose his son from the grave and has brought us from death to spiritual life. We believe he can do that, but we don't somehow think he can help us in the everyday matters. And we need to pray what the disciples prayed and that's Lord, increase our faith. And you know what the truth is? If my eyes are on me or my eyes are on my spouse, or my eyes are on you and they're not on Christ, I get it why I might not trust myself or others to be faithful. But Heston, Heston Chapel, I know we can trust him. And you could say, why? When I was a boy, that's the second copy of the chalk drawing that Bill Kramer made for my mom. When she went to the Reedsville CMA, the first one got destroyed in a fight. And Bill graciously made my mom another one. It's not identical. And you can actually see on that, that left side, because it's zoomed in, that there's a blemish on that one because it got knocked down in a, in a turmoil as well. When I say I know what it's like to go through battles like that, I really do. And, and I remember my mom telling me that someday, if I ever became a, a professional minister of some kind, she wanted this to hang in my office. I had no idea I'd ever be a pastor or a minister in any way. But that hangs in my office today. And I remember my mom telling me, because I never dated. I didn't want to date anyone. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to go through the things she went through. And my mom told me that there is a way that I can make sure that I didn't repeat what my family went through and that the chains could be broken. And it's because of the middle cross, my friends. 
It's when I put a laser focus on Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, and the power to live this Christian life individually, but also as a couple, that I didn't have to be afraid of going through what my family went through. And so when you ask me today, if you come into my office, why I say there's hope for every couple that walks on this side of glory, it will ever always be because of the middle cross on that drawing. And it's not just the middle cross on that drawing. It's because of the middle cross that stood on Golgotha's hill. And the same God who brought you to, to spiritual eternal life is the same God that can breathe life into the brokenness of your life right here, right now. If you'll turn to him and take him at his word and trust him. And my question is, Heston Chapel, will we do that? Will we take God as his word? Because if we say we're in Christ, if we say we're blood bought and born again, everything within inside of us through the Holy Spirit's power is drawing us to the truth of God's word. But the question is, will we respond in obedience, believing that the ultimate purpose of our life is the will of God, to bring him glory, and that everything that we need to accomplish that purpose and that will we have through Christ. If you can't say the definitively yes to that this evening, I'm going to be positioned here as long as I need to be, and I would love to spend time in prayer with you tonight. Let us pray as we get ready to sing our last song. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the price that was paid. We thank you for the measureless love of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who because of no fault of his own, no sin of his own, willingly died a death facing a wrath that was ours, paid a debt that we could never pay that was ours, for your glory and for our salvation. Lord, I, I thank you that we have hope because of your son, because of the plan that you set in eternity past and that you fulfilled. Lord God, if we are in Christ today, we're yours. Our lives are yours. We are not our own. And this flesh will buck against that. We'll fight against that. We will roll around, try to in the mud. We will justify the brokenness that we participate in in our lives. And the truth is when we gaze into the, the perfect law, the, the mirror of your word, we know it's not right. We know it's not true. We know that you are true. Your ways are right. They are good. And Lord, that you are more than able to accomplish your will and your purposes in our lives if we'll gaze on you and less on us. And I pray that we would do that. Lord, we live in a world that needs to see us as the body and the bride of Christ to continually grow in, in our ability and our willingness to live out the truth of your word. This is not a time to coast in our world history. It's never a time for the body of Christ to coast in reference to our devotion to you. And Lord, I know this much when my eyes are fixed on you and my heart is focused on the cross and who you are in my life. It permeates and it impacts every area of my life, every relationship, every conversation and everything that I'm a part of. Lord God, I pray you would help us to be anchored in Christ, our sure and steady anchor. In the areas in our lives and I pray especially in reference to our marriages from our, our topic this morning. If there are areas where we're falling short, and there will be, would you graciously sift them to the surface? Areas of selfishness, self-righteousness, stubbornness, bitterness. Lord, would you help us to repent of those things, to recognize who we're called to be, and through the Spirit's enablement to live that out for your glory, for the good of our spouse, for the good of our family, and Lord, for the edification of the, of the body of the church and for the salvation of the lost as they see Christ in us. Thank you for this time together tonight. And as each one leaves, Lord, I pray that they would remember your word, remember the cross, remember the cost, and your call upon our lives as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand and sing together, Christ the sure and steady anchor.
Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn, in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, while the tempest rages on, when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won, Deeper still then goes the anchor, though I justly stand accused. I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor, through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, O oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory and we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secured. And the calm will be the better for the storms that we endured. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Father, we, we've heard your word, we, we know the truth, and I thank you, Lord, that you've given us as your children the Holy Spirit to plant it deep in our hearts. And I pray, pray that as you illuminate that truth uh, for us, as, as you unpack that, and Lord, help us to recognize the areas in our lives where, where we're living in opposition to the truth. I pray that throughout the course of this week, we'd allow you to do the sanctifying work that you long to do. Lord, would you help this world to see through us who you are, starting with our families and outside the walls of our home for your own honor, your glory, and your praise. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Heston Chapel, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Have a great week.